died without someone to keep me from harming myself more than I did. I had become a garbage can for drugs. Street drugs, prescription drugs, paragoric, cough syrup with codeine, whatever I could get. I had been put on probation for the Czech forgeries and I kept getting arrested for drunk driving or for brandishing weapons. Needless to say, I was always in trouble with the probation officer and they would lock me up for a while, then send me off to another rehabilitation program or hospital. In 1974, I was sent to a long-term therapeutic community after spending about four months in county jail. I was very sick emotionally when I got there and stayed withdrawn for the first couple of months. I went through many intense changes in the time that I was there, most of them were positive. I learned to function with other people and started to become responsible again. They gave me a place to belong and something to believe in. What they couldn't give me was a way to live without drugs outside the confines of the therapeutic community. I was finally graduated from their program in 1977 and as a graduate and an employee, I was allowed to drink. I decided that I wanted to return to West Virginia because the lifestyle of New York is not for me. Really, I wanted to get away from them so I could try to use successfully. I got a job in my old hometown and started to see my old girlfriend who was still using. It wasn't long until I just let go and started shooting speed, and eating protein pills and methoqualone. I hit the depths of despair because the dope had me again after all that time away from it and nothing had changed. After all that therapy, I still couldn't control my dope, it controlled me. I felt hopeless and worthless like a total failure. I couldn't go back to the rehabilitation house because I felt like such a bad person, like a traitor. I lost my job and continued to use, getting most of my drugs legally from doctors. One doctor had become a friend of mine and felt sorry for me in my dilemma, and I used his compassion as a means to con him out of more and more drugs. I was using amphetamines, sedatives and various synthetic opiates all at the same time. I was miserable, my highs were like lows. I couldn't live with drugs but it was worse without them. I just tried to stay numb or seek oblivion. Nowhere to turn 151. No longer could I blame my using on others like before. Although I tried, I really knew the truth. I was off probation so that was no longer a threat, but still I was a prisoner to my addiction. Between my sprees of using I started to try church. I began to feel as though God was my only hope, but I wasn't sure if God really existed. Maybe I felt as though God might just be a philosophical idea to comfort man and make sense out of life, but I needed something real. I could not work and I hit another bottom and found myself alone and sick. It seemed as though being alone and sick were a way of life for me. At this point I was ready to ask for help in a sincere way. I didn't believe in coincidence anymore and it was a miracle that I stumbled upon a phone number of an NA member in the Atlanta, Georgia area. I spilled my guts to him over the phone and asked him what he thought. He said it sounded as though I needed to learn how to live without drugs. That was so simple, but it said it all. With God's help I caught a bus to Atlanta. In withdrawal and praying and some crying, I made the journey. 
I feel that the willingness and courage to make such a move came from a power greater than myself. God as I understand him has worked many miracles in my life in the past two years of my recovery. In those first meetings I heard people share honestly. They sat and talked with me, and they understood. They really cared because they were like me. They had been there. There was no condemnation or lectures. They gave me hope by their example. It really was possible to get a new way of life filled with happiness and usefulness to other people. I didn't have to be alone ever again. I could use my past to help others and pass this new way of life on to others who were in despair and misery. It was okay to let people know when I hurt. I didn't have to pretend to be cool and have all the answers or hide my true feelings. They loved me back to help. People were patient when I needed to talk. They listened and shared what had worked for them. I was a part of their lives. They taught me that the steps were the foundation of recovery. The program has freed me from my prison and shown me how to be myself and live life on its own terms. I owe my life to Narcotics Anonymous. God works through the people in this fellowship and it works if you want it to. Surrender has been the key for me. 152 Narcotics Anonymous If I work this program, my life gets better. Today I have friendship, love, and a family of brothers and sisters from all over the world, from all walks of life. We are united in a way that was once impossible for the addict. We have been delivered from a living and dying hell to happiness, peace, joy and a fulfillment that escapes our wildest dreams in the past. It has been freely given to me out of love. The program is simply sharing, working the 12 steps, attending meetings and practicing the principles of the program. First and foremost, I must remember that I suffer from a disease called addiction and that using is insanity and death. So I cannot take that first fix, pill or drink. Drugs in any form are poison to me and will kill me emotionally, spiritually, mentally and physically. God has revealed his love for me through the fellowship of N.A. I am grateful to be able to write my story and share it. I pray that it may be of some help and bring hope to someone like me who once had no hope. May God be with you in the spirit of this fellowship. I pray that this new way of life will bring you all the joy and love it has brought me. God bless. Recovery is my responsibility 153. Recovery is my responsibility. My name is Joe. I am an addict. Like most addicts that I have met, I did not begin my addiction with the intention of making myself sick, physically and morally. As I had done all my life, I sought escape from the stresses and demands of living. In later life, I called this having fun. Any pressure was too much to bear, and as my illness progressed, I retreated into a world of isolation and chemicals. During my childhood, I found escape in pretend games. I was not like my friends, I thought, so I sought the changes that were necessary for me to be acceptable. I tried new clothes, different hairstyles, even different sets of friends. I want to be liked. It never occurred to me that I must change inside. As I became older, my opportunities to alter my external environment expanded. I could change residences, find new jobs, get married or even divorced. I did all of these. No extreme was too far-reaching. 
My introduction to chemicals came in the mid-1960s during my teen years. Along with my friends, I partied on weekends, drinking alcohol at every opportunity. While everyone seemed to be enjoying the party, I was hiding in the ice chest. Later in life, I became the perfect hostess, fixing everyone's drink from the kitchen or bar. It was always everyone else and then me, with no realization that I drank more than I served. My senior year of high school found me experimenting with amphetamines. My consumption of alcohol had begun to affect my grades, as were the late night hours. I believe that by taking uppers, I could improve my study habits. I continue to believe this even as my grades plummeted. Graduation prevented me from failing at school or dropping out altogether. I came to the graduation ceremony drunk, much to the chagrin and disgust of my family. I had become argumentative with everyone. I couldn't even stand myself. During the next 14 years, my life decayed tragically. I tried changing everything but myself. After I married, I joined a church that strongly suggested that its members refrain from drinking. I so wanted to be accepted. 153. 154 Narcotics Anonymous. I did not drink for a year. I was at war with myself. I felt as I had as a child, that I was different. Try as I would, want as I would, I was not, and could not be like those good people at church. They did not understand me any better than I understood them. My decision to refrain from any drinking or drugs had nothing to do with my inability to handle them. Even when I abstained from chemicals, I did not fit. It was not a new hurt. I began drinking again, feeling guiltier than I had ever dreamed possible. Because I was a housewife and had no outside income, I padded the grocery bills in order to pay the liquor store and doctors and pharmacists. I felt myself clever indeed, and I also believed that I could at last. The delivery of my first child was a learning day for me. After I was admitted into the labor and delivery area of the hospital, I was given a shot for relief of pain and anxiety. I was never to forget, and I suffered pain and anxiety for another 12 years. There was always a drug for a symptom, and I learned quickly how to manipulate one to acquire the other. My life became one of appointments to doctor's offices, lies to them and to myself, prescriptions and trips to the hospital. I had many surgeries that could have and should have been avoided. Tragically, I often believed that I was sick. A few weeks after the birth of my second son in 1970, I suffered a total collapse. I was given tranquilizers and later hospitalized, where I received shock treatment for God only knows what purpose. The first hospital stay set me on a road of psychiatrists, mental health centers, and sure, certain ruin. Although my symptoms were clearly drug-related, I was treated with the very drugs that were killing me. I took depressants and became depressed. I took diet pills and mood elevators and became edgy and wouldn't eat. My behavior became manic-depressive when I took both, and I became psychotic when I added the drug alcohol. I had odd notions about life and I hated myself. I loathed my body. In the face of all of these bizarre symptoms, I was hospitalized innumerable times, where medications, drugs, were administered indiscriminately.
Eventually, as I moved into a drug culture, I learned to play the game. Popping prescription drugs was far easier than hustling, and somehow more respectable. My personal life was a shambles. I prostituted my mind and body. Nothing mattered. I wanted to die. During these years, my family tried to warn me about my warped state of mind, but I still hung on to the belief that they didn't understand. When I told my doctors of the conflicts at home, I was advised that, in fact, the family did not understand. I was given. Recovery is my responsibility 155. A prescription for yet another panacea, and I went on my way. In the end, the only people who had any time for me at all were the mental health professionals. I had an army of paid friends. I don't blame doctors or anyone else for my addiction, for my addictive personality is, and has always been, a part of me. Certain individuals in the mental health and physical health profession who should know better did contribute to my addiction and allowed it to continue. I know that recovery is my responsibility, with the help of God. I manipulated the medical profession, and not knowing what else to do, they obliged with prescriptions for symptoms, as they are so trained. I share this tragedy with too many others. Ironically, it was a psychologist that guided me into NA and another 12-step program. She had given up on me, and as a last resort, insisted that I attend those meetings. I went and have been clean since May, 1980. At that first meeting, I was hugged and made welcome. I said, I cried and found the road to a happy recovery. My world expanded and I began to grow. I had been looking for myself inside of myself, and had found myself empty. Coming into the 12 steps of N.A., I have found happiness outside of me. I have made the discovery that I must share so that I might keep anything at all, and that in the giving there is joy and satisfaction. I have learned that to be free, I must surrender, and that surrendering brings comfort. I have learned that it was, as much as drugs and alcohol, my total sense of self that was seducing me into death. The greatest discovery for me these past 20 months is that there is a power in the universe, that I know of God, who loves me. If I am to be a part of this world I must always be aware of my Creator. If I seek out His will for me and endeavor to carry out His will, my recovery is secure. The growth that I have enjoyed has not been without pain. I am continually made aware of my own character defects, and as I become willing, I rejoice in letting them go, as I turn my narcotics addiction over to God. Growing up at age 34 still baffles me, but my tears mean something. I have comfort in my hurts and a solution to my problems, whatever they might be. Today I have something that will last. 156 Narcotics Anonymous. Unmanageable. We are the same people cut from the same cut of cloth. I am a person who did a lot of time. I started drinking at first. I remember getting drunk at the age of 15 and falling across the grass and knocking my front tooth out by the sidewalk. I have never forgotten that I love to do anything that will keep me out of the here and now. I am nothing but another person acting a part of Narcotics Anonymous, nothing but another person trying to live clean and recover. I know for a fact that the program works, and I know that because I am one of the miracles, 
just like everyone in these rooms is one of the miracles. I remember my bottom. It was a typical night for someone without any money, any drugs, or any friends. I was lying in a house where the people had gone to jail. They set out to score and they did not ever come back. I was left there. I was watching the house, just waiting for someone to come, just waiting to score, so that I would be able to get well. But God saw fit for that not to happen. As I sat on the bed I pushed the cockroaches out of my face. There were a lot of them and I had a war going on with those bugs. I would turn out the light, I would catch a bunch of them and then I would put them down the toilet. And I was thinking, is this all there is for me in life? My arms were swollen from shooting drugs, my lips were red from drinking wine, and I felt like there was no hope. I remember I reached into my pocket and I had a 25 cent bus ticket left from the welfare office. I packed up a little bag of the little bit of clothes that I had left, and I caught the bus to the Veterans Administration Hospital. All the time I was riding my head was telling me, I just want to go and lay there. Find a domicile or something, just to lay down and die. But that was the day of my spiritual awakening. I was at the VA with spit creases that I had placed down the front of my pants, with another notch I had put in my belt with an ice pick to hold them up, with 160 pounds on my body, I looked like a skeleton of my former self. While trying to get in the methadone program, I ran across a person on the program who was to become my sponsor. We had spent time in prison together. He asked me how I was doing. At first I told him, I'm doing okay. But I knew deep in my heart that I was not. 156. Unmanageable 157. Doing worth a damn. I remember feeling the words just coming out of my mouth. As I said, I want to go into the recovery house. I wanted to try it one more time and give it my best shot. I thought that I had suffered a heart attack and was dying, because I felt just like an empty shell. They took me into this hospital and got me back to health. First, there was my health back in line, then my thinking got a little clearer. I remember when I first started going to meetings after being dry for about 90 days. I remember seeing people at meetings. It sounds corny, but I wanted what they had. I wanted to be able to say, my name is Bill and I am an addict. And I am doing something about my life. I used to think that the people there were conning. That's what my head was saying. But deep in my heart I knew what they were saying was true. Today I have learned how to be more of a person. I have learned how to feel a lot better. When I was sitting in the rooms of NA meetings, I kept going back, kept doing what people said to do. I did my inventory, took a fourth step and a fifth step. Then I took a look at my character defects and then I could understand what people had meant and talked about. I never will forget when the light flipped on and I knew that this was all about living. After that, I went right into the steps to the best of my ability. It started because I knew for a fact that my life was unmanageable because I was unmanageable. This was where drugs and alcohol had brought me and left me. I knew that if I stayed around this program, followed directions, and if I prayed, then maybe God would restore me to sanity. I am not wrapped too tight now, but I realize that some are sicker than others. I know for a fact that it works when I ask that mine will be removed and I just surrender.
Rogers is a little dog. This is the third step. It's hard. It's hard to work with will instead of my own, but I do it to the best of my ability today. When I took my fourth step, I wrote out all those little things that make me think I am less than someone else. My fifth step was one of the hardest for me because I did not want to share with another human being those things that made my character defect so glaring. Yet sharing with another human being and God is another action step. It has taken me one and a half years to really understand what a sixth step is because I was clean in recovering and just becoming aware of my character defect. With the willingness that I have learned from my third step, and the knowledge that I have obtained through my fourth and fifth step, gave me strength to ask God to remove these defects. I have to ask this. 158 Narcotics Anonymous. Every day. I did my sixth and seventh steps together, not really knowing the difference between character defects and shortcomings, which I am not too sure about today. Working the eighth step was not too difficult because of my awareness of the fourth through seventh step. I remember when I made my first amends. God, how I felt, but when I made my last one, I felt all the weight of the world being lifted off of me. One night I was speaking at an NA meeting when I looked over and there was my prime partner's sister. The very girl to whom I owed my last amend. God gave me the willingness, the courage, and the opportunity to complete my ninth step. I knew then that I never had to go back out again because of snitching on someone. You can't go back to the ghetto where you came from. I realized it was all over and I felt good. I am one of those for whom taking a tenth step at night is not hard. That fear and hurt I had inside of me is gone. Something that was difficult for me was the eleventh step. It took spiritual lady and other things I won't get into now, to learn to meditate, and I am grateful for those experiences. After that conscious contact, I review and look over each step each day. I love the 12th step like I love the program, like I love my God, and my life today. The 12th step has given me a way to go. I work with others, share at meetings, support NA as a whole, by being active. I am just so, so grateful that God has seen to let me live again, and for the people who have been put into my life. When I started working with steps I was in my second year, going into my third year of being seen, and just like the miracle of the program, I am finishing my third year of being seen and going into my fourth year. Now I have six years. Smile. Asterisk. I never would have thought while going into the VA hospital one rainy morning that my life would become so rich and so full. I have more friends.
my fourth step, and shared my fifth. It was right about that time that I felt a real and true relief. I call this inner peace serenity. With such great content, it was easy to continue through the steps. I no longer hated myself for my defects, for I had faith that they would be removed by my higher power, in his own time. I am no longer afraid of my past. I know who I have wronged. I have squared with these people and I am willing to square with those I cannot find. I practice the 10th, 11th, and 12th steps on a daily basis, and have experienced a 180 degree turnaround which I call recovery. I really feel good today and I'm grateful to my higher power and Narcotics Anonymous for giving me a recovery that I can enjoy and share with other addicts. Physician Addict 161 Physician Addict I have a recollection of sitting in my office late one afternoon listening to the story of a heroin addict consulting me about a problem with his gallbladder. He needed hospitalization and surgery and I was informing him about the procedure he was about to undergo. I felt a strong sense of revulsion as he confided to me about his habit and his concern about his need for strong analgesics in the hospital. I told him in my own unknowing way that it would be very helpful if he could at least stop using for a week or two before the operation. I had ingrained images of him in acute withdrawal, writhing around on the floor pleading for his next fix. It had been a long day, and after the patient left I thought about his terrible plight and the disgusting thing he was doing to himself. I sat back, reached into my top drawer, pulled out a short-acting narcotic and syringe and gave myself free passage into a world of relaxation from the tension of the day. Like most physicians, I had practically no comprehension of addiction in others and certainly no recognition of it in myself. I was a busy surgeon insidiously developing a disease which cleverly had insinuated itself into my life. Addicts and addiction were foreign to my understanding, and my medical school training had barely even touched upon the subject. I was also the unknowing, indiscriminate supplier of thousands of major and minor tranquilizers and narcotics to patients, many of whom became addicts themselves. From intermittent bottles of protein cough syrup in the Air Force to increasingly stronger medications for headaches, insomnia, and stress, I developed a slow but progressive desire for something to ease my pain of living. At some point, I crossed that magical line separating me, the addict, from the occasional user. I lied to cover up my habit, and yet my wife always knew and this led to progressive deterioration in our marriage. I would use Layton each day and would arrive home in a semi-stupor estate, eat a quick dinner and fall into bed early in the evening. By morning, I felt rested and ready to face another day. The more I knew, the more I felt then. 161 162 Narcotics Anonymous Impending sense of doom and destruction Periods of drug-induced relaxation were often followed by periods of severe anxiety and depression. My colleagues noticed the change and one recommended that I seek psychiatric help. The pattern of my illness would have been obvious to any physician who knew as little as I did. On one occasion, I was actually caught and confronted by a colleague, whose only comment to me was a cajole and cut it out before you get into trouble. I spent long hours spilling my emotions to a psychiatrist and for a while things seemed better. I even used less for a while, but eventually I got back into the regular and progressive pattern of using. 
Speaking about the ocean. They knew little of my problem and understood it as I understood it, not at all. But they insisted that I seek out help or they would have to take measures to protect me from myself and to protect patients. I was bereft of any stable judgment and have lost all my self esteem and desire to live. I gave up at that moment and called a hotline established for physician. I met with an individual a few hours later who started to listen to my story. After only a few moments, and after seeing my physical and emotional condition, he held up his hand as if to say stop. You're addicted. Do you want to do something about it? He asked. When I answered, yes, he stated that I needed to be detoxified in a hospital. I put up a token resistance, but quickly acquiesced and was taken to a drug rehabilitation center. Nothing more seemed to matter. My pride was gone. I often reflect on those last moments and how myself will deteriorate to such a point where I was ready to give in. I don't understand even today what happened to convince me to go into a hospital, and that was perhaps my first introduction to what I later grew to understand as a higher power in some way watching over my life. 
Until the day I walked into the hospital in this program, I was an intellectual and staunch atheist, who could not reconcile any force outside myself in my comings and goings. I had always done for myself and by myself and was convinced that man must make his way alone in life. I was in for a rude awakening. Some come into this program by attending meetings alone and some are fortunate enough to be hospitalized, medically detoxified and gradually helped into the program of Narcotics Anonymous. I am a stubborn man and somehow I feel that nothing less than the intensive hospital force was needed to turn my head. I entered the facility in arrogance, wealthy position devoid of humility and looking down upon the tragic, deplorable individuals around me. I had the audacity in my first moment in the acute detoxification unit to ask the therapist for her qualifications and what she thought she could do for me. She smiled at my hostility and merely replied, I'm clean, baby, and you aren't for starters. People on the program often talk about reaching the bottom before being able to take the first step toward recovery. We are surrounded today by people who have entered the group of what appear to be very different. 164 Narcotics Anonymous Levels of personal, economic, and social collapse. But I feel that most have reached their own bottom. Something inside cries out, enough, enough, I've had enough, and then they are ready to take that first and often most difficult step toward dealing with their disease. So it was with me. With all I had outwardly, I had lost almost everything inwardly. I had reached my bottom as surely as the addict on Skid Row. I remember clearly my fourth day in the hospital sitting in a session with a group of male addicts, trying to remain somewhat aloof from the wretched individuals around me. After all, I was a physician, not a bum. And the man who was leading the session, noting my arrogance, suddenly turned and staring icily at me asked, What do you think about all this, junkie? Something inside me snapped at that moment and as the tears welled up in my eyes, I sank into the deepest depression I had ever known, only to be followed by a clearer vision of who I am than I had ever had before, and from that moment on I was able to say without hesitation or qualification, I'm an addict. That has made all the difference. I began to change over the next two weeks and I began to attend NA meetings regularly. I initially felt that it would be impossible to attend more than one or two meetings a week. It just wouldn't fit in with my busy schedule. I later learned that my priorities were 110 degrees reversed. It would be everything else that would have to fit into my meeting schedule. An individual much wiser than I told me that my recovery had to come first, before everything else in my life, before my wife and children, before my job and my friends, because if I didn't make that commitment, I would lose all those things anyway. So first things first, not losing is the bottom line and all else follows. My program now consists of attending meetings regularly, reading the literature and following the 12 steps to the best of my ability. I have learned the meaning of the word honest, both with others and myself, and I am slowly learning that once foreign word, humility. The program has not only given me a way of not using drugs a day at a time, it has also given me a program of living, also a day at a time, that had previously been unknown to me. 
I have learned that in NA there is a veracity to such saying good. I can, but we can, and, keep coming back, to meeting. Most of all, I am learning to accept myself for what I am. Recently, I went on a skiing vacation in the mountains and I sought out the fellowship of addicts at a meeting there. It was heartwarming to be immediately welcomed into a new group so far from home, where I again met. Physician Addicts 165 People from all walks of life united by our common bond. It's a fellowship that I cherish, for these people are helping me to stay drug-free and helping me to maintain my intellectual as well as physical recovery. Recovery is a healing process from which I am emerging stronger and more able to face the tasks ahead of me. It is sad that we must pass through such hell before reaching the serenity of peace of mind and recovery. Over the gates of Dante's Inferno is a sign which reads, Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. They fit well the portals of the attic's personal hell. It has been a slow but progressive passage back through those gates into a world where there is once again hope for those who follow the N.A. program and its 12 steps out of the abyss of addiction. As the years pass, I am sure that the growing awareness and understanding of addiction by the medical profession will parallel a public awareness which will make narcotics anonymous and its program more prescient of the world of the addict. 166 Narcotics Anonymous Part of the Solution Living on a farm as a child I felt inferior and was shy around other people. I was full of fear and became very angry when things didn't go my way. This behavior continued during my adolescent years. When I was 21 years old, I married and still continued to try and change reality, wanting everyone to agree with me, thinking I was right and reacting with temper tantrums when people disagreed with me. I became a mother of three children. With my first child I still felt in control, with my second I became overwhelmed, with my third I felt desperate. I wanted somebody to take care of me, rather than me taking care of others. Being responsible as a mother frightened me. Wanting to be perfect made me feel more scared and angry. One day my husband went to our minister hoping something could be done for me since I was so angry toward him and life in general. The minister didn't feel he could help me, so they found a psychologist in a city 200 miles away for me to drive to and from for weekly appointments. It was at this time that a mild tranquilizer was prescribed for me by a doctor who was a friend of the psychologist. The psychologist was kind and tried to be helpful, he thought that seeing him and taking medication would help me with my anger. Hopefully, I would start coping with reality better. It wasn't long until the psychologist thought I would be better if I were put on a different tranquilizer, so with the help of the doctor, my prescription was changed. It was very early in my pill popping that I became dependent on them, thinking that I could not exist without their help. We continued to move as my husband's jobs changed throughout the Midwest. Eventually I remember sitting in a rocking chair and the thought of suicide crossed my mind, yet I told myself that my life wasn't unmanageable. Today, I believe that moment is when I crossed from dependency to addiction. 
166. Heart of the Solution 167. Continuing to use, abuse and overdosing my pills, I ended up in a hospital in the psychiatric ward. It was at this time that I needed a psychiatrist to visit me in the hospital to help me with my problem. The psychiatrist came in and told me, you don't like yourself very well, do you? I said, you aren't telling me anything I don't know. I left the hospital in a few days, and came home with the understanding that I would see the psychiatrist weekly. I would go to the psychiatrist's office and things didn't seem to get any better. I was fearful that he would take my prescriptions for my pills away from me because I was not taking them as prescribed. Changing my prescription from one brand of pills to another brand didn't seem to help. When I didn't have enough tranquilizers to take I would take the antidepressant. I expected the pills to be a miracle cure for reality. I went to great lengths to get attention during my addiction. One day I turned on the gas before my husband came home, making sure I turned it off before he came in the door, thinking he would be alarmed and express care about what happened to me. He was alarmed and decided, with the help of the minister and psychiatrist, that I needed to go to the hospital for more help. I knew from past experience that psychiatric wards didn't seem to help me with my mental problems. Things calmed down for a while with me changing brands again and seeing the psychiatrist to renew my prescription. In the meantime, I was visiting a social worker, telling her when I was on one of the tranquilizers, taking it as prescribed, making the world okay. I wonder why everybody isn't taking this type of drug, I thought. Approximately six weeks later, the effects of the pills wore off and I was abusing them. When the tranquilizers were running low, I'd overdose the antidepressants and toss and turn in bed feeling terrible but still using, abusing, and overdosing them. One night after taking several antidepressants, I ended up in the hospital on the cardiac ward, lying to the nurses about which pills I had taken and being told that I should feel lucky to be going home so soon. However, I didn't feel lucky or care about living. I was a pill counter, making sure I had enough of my drug of choice, tranquilizers, left in my cupboard, thinking this was the way to face reality, by taking pills each day. One evening I dissolved 50 aspirin in a glass of water, drank it until my ears rang, then dumped the rest of it out. This caused attention to be focused on me in a negative manner. 168 Narcotics Anonymous Eventually my husband and I parted, and I remarried. Less than a month into my second marriage I became angry, stood at the kitchen sink, pills in my hand, thinking, I have no reason to take them, but swallowing the handful anyway. After sharing with my husband what I had done, he suggested I call a mutual friend that we had in the other fellowship. She told me that I had a pill problem. It was revealed to me that I had a problem with tranquilizers. I went to open meetings of the other fellowship and sat back, not wanting to level my pride and identify myself as a drug addict at NA or the other fellowship. I was not able to stay away from abusing pills and after my friend moved to another city, it became apparent that if I wanted to live free of mind-altering drugs, I had to go to meetings and admit I was a drug addict. 
When I started going to NA after five months of living drug-free, the obsession was lifted from me and a burning desire was given to me to stop using. I would look at myself in the mirror and say out loud, you are a drug addict. Between my first and second year, I was able to admit to my innermost self that all pills, not just a select group, were a problem for me. The first half of the first step is the only part of the 12 steps I can work perfectly a day at a time. Today a free gift has been given to me that I am powerless over all mind-altering drugs. For years, my pills were a power greater than myself. I took them for the effect that they produced. Today, because of the grace of God, I have been restored to sanity. The insanity of the second step is the thinking that precedes the first fix, kill or drink. My life is made up of daily situations which, if I want to live a life of peace and serenity, I turn over to the care of God as I understand Him. Being willing to do this has made my life more manageable, for I am letting go of my own self will run riot. Turning things over to a higher power who cares helps me with my faith and trust that there is a divine plan for my life. There is an acceptable place for me in society and the program. I have taken this step with another human being. When I wrote my inventory, it was suggested that I write about my anger, fear and guilt. I wrote it as an autobiography, starting as far back as I could remember, before I started school as a child, up to the time when I came off drugs. I named the names of the people I resented, remembering I was taking my own inventory and not that of others. Part of the Solution 169 The fifth step I took was my first sponsor. With her I shared the dark side of my life and, eventually, relief and freedom have come into my life. My understanding is that if I share the wrongs I have done then the good spiritual feelings will automatically become a part of my life. The sixth step reminds me to become entirely ready to become honest, open-minded and willing to have my defects of character removed. I listed my defects in the inventory I wrote down, and in time more have been revealed to me a day at a time. Through working the 12 steps, the obsession and compulsion to use will be removed. Having my shortcomings removed is a goal to strive for for the rest of my days. It's been shared that the 6th and 7th steps are often the forgotten steps of the program. I ask each day to have my anger removed from my life. I made a list of the people that I had harmed and have made direct amends to them, including my children. Each day I don't lose. I am making amends in time to my higher power, myself, and society. Today, I spot check myself when I'm off the spiritual beam and share my resentment with another human being so they will be cut in half. Each day, I say, please, in the morning and, thank you, at night. It has been shared that those who sincerely say please won't go back to using, if you don't think of it in the morning, say it when you think of it. When I heard this, I started making a business each day of saying, please. I read literature from both fellowships and go to step meetings to help me grow spiritually. My way of living before I was an addict and after I became one didn't work, so I have had to work the steps and try to practice them in my daily living so I can become useful and whole. Today, I'm grateful to be a part of the solution, rather than the problem.
170 Narcotics Anonymous Resentment of the world I had living problems before I ever started using drugs At an early age, I Developed a strong resentment against alcohol I was hit by a car and the driver was drunk Later I had resentments toward days after I was raped I had resentments towards my parents after I found out that I was born illegitimate. By the age of 13, I hated almost everyone. I also started using at that age. My first experience with drugs was smoking pot and drinking alcohol. It relieved me of all my pain. Although I did get sick, that didn't matter. I loved it anyway and I set out to find ways not to get sick. I didn't drink very much after that. I started getting in trouble at home and at school. I was blaming my troubles on authority. I started rebelling at school, and I refused to communicate in any way with my father. Things just kept getting worse. If I didn't have pot, I felt very lonely and left out. At about this time, I lost my ability to think clearly and as a result I got thrown off the football team. I became very resentful over this. I blamed it on one of my teammates because he told the coach that I was smoking pot. At about this time, my parents decided to move because of my reputation. They thought if I moved away, I would get better. This, of course, didn't work. Wherever I went, my disease went with me. In the new town, I was introduced to harder drugs and I used them because they took me further away from reality. I started using acid and speed heavily, and I also started healing. After a short time, I was busted for dealing in school and I was sent to jail. This was the first of many times to come. I was repeatedly getting busted in school so as soon as I could I quit school. After that I hit the streets, I was dealing acid and using it very heavily. The progression of the disease set in. I kept getting locked up. I had no one, and I would do anything to get my drugs. As time went on, I just kept getting more into acid. Everyone told me I was living in a fantasy world, and I was. I wouldn't look at reality at all. 170. Resentment at the World 171. I had no time for it in my world. My spirituality had changed from Roman Catholic to Satanism. I felt like I had no place in any kind of good world. I had tried to stop using many times, but it never worked because I couldn't deal with the world. I started to try suicide about this time. I didn't feel that I had any reason to live, but I was too afraid of death to kill myself. I felt totally insane after my last suicide attempt. I tried to kill my brother. At that time my mother threw me out. When I was packing to leave, it hit me that I was really sick, and I asked to be committed to a mental institution. I saw a psychiatrist and he recommended a drug detox. I wanted help, so I went. When I was in detox, I was introduced to Narcotics Anonymous and I finally felt like I fit in somewhere. They showed me the 12 steps of recovery and told me that if I used them I'd get better. Having been beaten enough, I admitted to the first step and I felt relieved. The second step was hard for me to do at first, but I used the group as the power greater than myself. To believe in God, I had to pray for faith and shortly the belief came to me. 
At this time, I took a third step, which I followed by a fourth and fifth step. At that time, I experienced the relief and freedom as I hadn't experienced any time in life. I used the rest of the steps to keep my life in order, and a sponsor helped me do the steps. Now I go to meetings at least six times a week. In meetings, I found that I can share with other people involved with recovery. We have a common bond. A few months ago, I went to my first service conference, which gave me the faith to start new meetings in the area where I live. At the time, we only had one meeting a week and now there are seven meetings a week. Being involved in service makes me feel worthwhile. 172 Narcotics Anonymous Mid-Pacific Serenity I am a happy, grateful drug addict, clean by the grace of God and the 12. Steps of Narcotics Anonymous Life today is fulfilling and there is joy in my heart. It wasn't always this way. I drank and used drugs for 12 years, on a daily basis for 10 of them. I was an addict of the hopeless variety. It really seems to me that I was born this way. I was born and raised in Southern California, in a loving middle-class family. Both my sister and I were wanted, loved children and were shown that in every way. As far back as I can remember, I have felt separate from this family and all of life. Of course, I am talking of an intense fear of life. I cannot remember feeling the simplicity of being a child. I had the addict's personality growing up, self will run riot. I always wanted my own way, and if I didn't get it, I sure let everyone know. Growing up in Southern California, I seemed to get into all the normal things, going to the beach, getting into sports, yet always the tears and feelings of inadequacy never let me live up to my potential. I was an average student throughout school, had lots of friends yet I was true, dominated by the fear. I guess I was about 15 when I tried my first drug, alcohol. From the first drink it was oblivion. Finally I had found freedom from fear, or so I thought. From the beginning I identified with the rejects, the people who slept on the beach, under the tears. As I look back over these 12 years, I see how I love each new drug I tried. Alcohol was only the beginning, if it got you loaded, I wanted to try it and I always wanted more. It didn't matter if it was sniffing you or shooting the best coke or heroin. I wasn't a rich, cheesy addict, I just needed to stay high and all my energy was put into that direction. I quit school in the 12th grade. Surfing had become part of my life, so it was off to Hawaii. My parents were very confused about their son who didn't do a very good job of hiding his desperation. To all who were sane and living life, I appeared very lost and unhappy. You see, it was us. 172. Mid-Pacific Serenity 173. Very short time after I started using, that the alcohol and drugs quit doing for me what they did in the beginning. The fear had returned, only much worse than before. My first trip to Hawaii in 1962 was only the beginning of many more to come, always trying to run from myself. Hawaii was, and is, a paradise, but I only saw it through the eyes of being loaded. Thanks to the warm weather, it was easy to pursue the only life I knew, 
The way of life was to wander the streets and sleep in parked cars or other available shelters. At the age of 19, I was back in Hawaii for the third time, a full-blown addict and so lost and confused I only knew I had to drink and use drugs and there was no other way. Returning to California at the end of the summer of 1963, I found myself joining the Navy. Being lost, that seemed to be the easiest thing to do, just sign my name. It was easier than looking for a job. I was so burned out already and wanted something different, yet didn't know how to ask for help. The Navy, of course, was not the answer. The drugs continued and after two years I was discharged. The psychiatrist said my mind had become disordered from the use of marijuana and LSD, plus I had jumped overboard in rage at the Navy. I convinced myself that once I got out of the Navy things would be different, no one would be telling me what to do, but I met a new friend at this point, the world of fixing. This was in 1965 and the next six years were the worst years of my life. As I see it today, those years got me into the program. After getting out of the Navy, I got married. How and why this woman married me is a mystery even today. On our wedding night, I shot some dope and slept on Venice Beach with my dog. This is the type of behavior a selfish, self-centered addict has, concerned only with himself and getting loaded. The way I was able to stay loaded was by dealing, always being the middle man. The house where we lived was being washed, it was on the Venice Canal in Venice, California. My parents knew what was going on, so with my wife four months pregnant they helped us get out of there, and it was back to Hawaii. We lived on the North Shore, it was a more isolated part of Oahu, lots of young people lived there. This was the year 1967 and at this time, LSD was really popular and everyone was into the spiritual thing, Eastern religion and gurus. There were two Harvard professors who were taking LSD and saying that you could find God, so I thought all that love, peace, and joy sounded good. I wanted out of the feelings that I was having. Fear dominated my 174 Narcotics Anonymous Life I had been shooting a lot of speed in California the past year. I decided to clean up my life in Hawaii, so I took psychedelics, smoked hashish and tried to meditate. Somewhere I had read that when the student was ready, the teacher would appear. Little did I know that the program of Narcotics Anonymous was about to be introduced to me, and that it would become my teacher. I was able to stay away from shooting dope that year. My wife and I had a baby girl and were on welfare, living in the country. I seemed to be fitting right into the movement of the time, flower children, see everything is beautiful consciousness. Yet still, inside, everything wasn't beautiful. There was a four-bedroom house next door to us for rent, and one day this woman appeared and told us that God had told her that she was supposed to live there. She was in her fifties, had long gray hair to her waist and wore a bikini most of the time. She had no money, but said she was led to this house. This woman seemed to radiate a feeling of love and joy that I had never felt from anyone else before. Immediately upon meeting her, I felt as if I had known her forever. Something in me was drawn to her. 
Little did I know that she was to become my sponsor, and play such a big part in my life. This was the beginning of a journey that even today amazes me. It is a way of life, a way of learning complete trust in a higher power. Through a series of miracles, which I now have come to see is quite normal to my life, this woman ended up in this house with the rent paid every month. Needless to say, this house became a program house. A meeting was started at this house. It was called the Beachcomber Spiritual Progress Traveling Group and through the years it has traveled throughout the United States, from Hawaii to the East Coast, and through Europe twice, always attracting the addict who still suffers, offering a way up and out. I remember my first meeting at this house in 1968. For the first time, I felt as if I really belonged. Not so much because I heard people talk of using drugs as I had, but because they spoke of what was going on inside. For the first time, I found out that other people had fears also. Yet with all the hope this meeting brought me, it was only the beginning of a three-year period that I would not want to live through again. I identified from that first meeting and wanted a new way of life. I would stay clean for a short period, and then I would use again. First I would just pick up a beer or smoke a joint, but I would always end up shooting dope again. I didn't understand it then, today I realized that I still had reservations. There was still that thought that I could use. Mid-Pacific Serenity 175 In the year 1970 I stayed clean for three months two different times. The last time was right before Christmas, I smoked two joints and went into convulsions. After that, I took two downs once and that was it. For almost an entire year I didn't know what it was to be clean again. I drank, took pills, and shot cocaine and heroin daily. Living on the North Shore made it easy to stay out of trouble. There weren't many police in that area. I stayed loaded. My wife left and I knew that I would never stay clean again. One time I ran out of dope and I shot several hundred milligrams of caffeine tablets and went into the shakes for hours. I seemed to be so desperate to die. Although I never woke up in the gutter or on skid row, I woke up on the beach, under a palm tree, with my face in the sand. The feelings were the same, Kid Row is in the mind. I really feel that it doesn't matter what or how much we use, where we live or how much money we have, it's what is going on inside that counts. For me, I knew I was dying but still couldn't stop. I'd given up on NA, everyone I knew in the program had left. My sponsor and a group of clean addicts were in Europe and one of the clean addicts was living on another island and would call every so often to see if I was still alive. On the morning of October 20, 1971, I woke up with bills in the house and for some reason I walked out to the beach and didn't get loaded the moment I opened my eyes. I remember it was a grey, overcast day and I was feeling hopeless. I just sat on the beach crying, just wanting to die, I couldn't go on. A feeling went through me that I never experienced before in my life. I felt warm and peaceful inside. A voice said, it's over, you never have to lose again. I felt a peace I had never felt before. I returned to the house, packed some stuff and headed for the airport. I was going to the island of Maui, where my clean friend was. 
Yes, my recovery started with miracles. I had no money, yet I was led to the right places at the right times and I got to Maui. I walked in and told him that I was ready to go to any lengths to stay clean. Staying clean today goes a long way beyond not taking that first fix, pill or drink, it is a way of life, a life that I call an adventure. I have an outline for living, it is the 12 steps of NA. I either practice and live these steps or I die. I really believe that a person who stays clean for any amount of time is staying clean for periods when it seems to make no sense to stay clean. I feel we all have felt like that at one time or another. 176 Narcotics Anonymous I've stayed clean by the grace of God. The steps have become my life. I've had to take many inventories, the fourth and fifth steps, and I will continue to have to write down what is going on inside me and give it away. For me, this is the way it works. Keep giving away the old and making room for the new. For me, it never gets really easy to do. Usually I have to be backed up against the wall and humiliated and then I share. They say that this is a program of action, that you can't keep it without giving it away, how true it is. In the beginning, I thought I had to say all the right things and save everyone. Today I realize I only have what's in my heart to share. Today, I can walk into a meeting and if I am full of the Father's love, then I share it, yet there are times that I walk into a meeting and want to throw the coffee pot through the window. Yet I have to stay honest, for that's the way I stay clean. I know today that staying clean and having a relationship with God as I understand Him is the most important thing in my life. When I do that and carry the message to the ones who still suffer, then all else is provided in my life. I really believe that I don't have to prove anything to anybody. I carry the message by letting the newcomer know who I am inside and sharing how I work the steps one day at a time. Since getting clean in 1971, life has been anything but boring. I have traveled all over. My sponsor was an able example of following your heart, and that wherever we went, N.A. was alive. Our houses were always open, with a coffee pot going. We started meeting wherever we arrived. Sometimes we had no money, but we went out to do our primary purpose and God always showed us the way. My sponsor died three years ago with 18 years clean. Most of the group has family now, and were scattered around the United States, learning different lessons, yet N.A. always comes first. Today, I am married and pursue different things than during the first seven years of my recovery, yet I know that the only way I can have any outside gifts is to put this program and God first. We really have found a way up and out, and so long as we keep giving it away, no matter if it is love and joy or tears and fears, it will be all right. Today I live because people are there who care and will listen. I really believe in magic, for my life is full of it. God is loving us now. The Vicious Cycle 177 The Vicious Cycle I am Jean and I am an addict. In writing this I hope that I can help others. Addicts like myself who are trying to overcome their addiction by substituting one thing for another. That was my pattern. I started drinking, whenever possible, at the age of 14. 
With this I added weight so that I could feel at ease and be comfortable with my surroundings in the social activities in high school. At 17, I started on heroin and quickly became addicted. After using heroin for one and a half years, I decided to admit myself to an institution. When they accepted my application, I got scared and joined the army after kicking at home. I thought that being away from my environment I would be able to solve my problem. Even here I found myself going AWOL to get more heroin. I was then shipped to Europe and thought that if I just drank, that would be the answer, but again I found nothing but trouble. Upon my release I came back home to the same environment. Again I was using heroin and various other drugs. This lasted about two years. The rat race really began when I tried to clean up, cough syrup, vinnies, fixes, etc. By now, I didn't know where one addiction left off and the other started. A year before I came to Narcotics Anonymous I found myself hopelessly addicted to cough syrup, drinking 5 or 6 4 ounce bottles a day. I needed help so I went to a doctor, he prescribed Dexedrine and would give me a shot that made me feel good. I found myself going to him practically every day. This continued for about 8 months and I was very happy with my newfound legal addiction. I was also getting codeine from a different doctor. I now became insanely afraid and began drinking too. This went on around the clock for a month and I ended up in a mental institution. After being released from the hospital, I thought I was free from narcotics and now I could drink socially. I soon found out I could not. It was then that I sought help from NA. 177. 178 Narcotics Anonymous. Here I learned that my real problem did not lie in the drugs that I had been using, but in a distorted personality that had developed over the years of my using and even before that. In NA, I was able to help myself with the help of others in the fellowship. I find I am making progress in facing reality and I'm growing a day at a time. I find new interests now that mean something, and realize that that was one of the things which I was looking for in drugs. Sometimes I still find it difficult to face things, but I'm no longer alone and can always find someone to help me over the rough and confused spots. I have finally found people like myself who understand how I feel. I'm now able to help others to find what I have, if they really want it. I thank God, as I understand Him, for this way of life. I was different 179. I was different. My story may differ from the others you have heard, in that I was never arrested or hospitalized. I did, however, reach the point of utter despair which so many of us have experienced. It is not my track record that shows my addiction but rather my feelings and my life. Addiction was my way of life the only way of life I knew for many years. Thinking back, I must have taken one look at life and decided I didn't want any part of it. I came from a, good old-fashioned, upper-middle-class broken home. I can't remember a time when I haven't been strung out. As a small child, I found out I could ease the pain with food, and here my drug addiction began. I became part of the pill mania of the 1950s. Even at this time I found it hard to take medication as directed. I figured that two pills would do twice as much good as one. I remember hoarding pills, 
stealing from my mother's prescription, having a hard time making the pills last until the next refill. I continued to use in this way throughout my early years. When I was in high school and the drug craze hit, the transition between drugstore dope and street dope was a natural. I had already been using drugs on a daily basis for nearly 10 years, these drugs had virtually stopped working. I was plagued with adolescent feelings of inadequacy and inferiority. The only answer I had was that if I took something I either was, felt or acted better. The story of my street using is pretty normal. I used anything and everything available every day. It didn't matter what I took so long as I got high. Drugs seemed good to me in those years. I was a crusader, I was an observer, I was afraid, and I was alone. Sometimes I felt all-powerful and sometimes I prayed for the comfort of idiocy, if only I didn't have to think. I remember feeling different, not quite human, and I couldn't stand it. I stayed in my natural state, floated. In 1966, I think, I got turned on to heroin. After that, like so many of us, nothing else will do the thing for me. At first I joy coughed occasionally, and then used only on weekends, but a year later I had a habit, and 179 180 Narcotics Anonymous Two years later I flunked out of college and started working where my connection worked. I used stuff and dealt, and ran for another year and a half before I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. I found myself strung out and no longer able to function as a human being. During this last year of my using, I started looking for help. Nothing worked. Nothing helped. Somewhere along the line I had gotten the telephone number of a man in N.A. Against my better judgment and without hope, I made what may well be the most important phone call of my life. No one came to save me, I wasn't instantly cured. The man simply said that if I had a drug problem, I might benefit from the meeting. He gave me the address of a meeting for that night. It was too far to drive, and besides I was sticking. He also gave me the address of another meeting a couple of days later and closer to home. I promised him I'd go and have a look. When the night came, I was deathly afraid of getting busted, and afraid of the dope fiends I would find there. I knew I wasn't like the addict you read about in books or newspapers. Despite these fears I made my first meeting. I was dressed in a three-piece black suit, black tie, and 84 hours off a two and a half year run. I didn't want you to know what and who I was. I don't think I fooled anybody, I was screaming for help, and everybody knew it. I really don't remember much of that first meeting, but I must have heard something that brought me back. The first feeling I do remember on this program was the gnawing fear that because I'd never been busted or hospitalized for drugs, I might not qualify and might not be accepted. I used twice during my first two weeks around the program, and finally gave up. I no longer cared whether or not I qualified, I didn't care if I was accepted, I didn't even care what the people thought of me. I was too tired to care. I don't remember exactly when, but shortly after I gave up, I began to get some hope that this program might work for me. I started to imitate some of the things the winners were doing. I got caught up in N.A.
I felt good. It was great to be clean for the first time in years. After I'd been around for about six months, the novelty of being clean wore off, and I fell off that rosy cloud I'd been riding. It got hard. Somehow I survived the first dose of reality. I think the only things I had going for me then were the desire to stay clean, no matter what, faith that things would work out okay so long as I didn't lose, and people who were willing to help when I asked for help. Since then, it's been an uphill fight, I've had. I was different 181. To work to stay clean. I found it necessary to go to many meetings, to work with newcomers, to participate in NA, to get involved. I've had to work the 12 steps the best I could, and I've had to learn to live. Today, my life is much simpler. I have a job I like, I'm comfortable in my marriage, I have real friends, and I'm active in NA. This type of life seems to suit me fine. I used to spend my time looking for the magic of people, places, and things, which would make my life ideal. I no longer have time for magic. I'm too busy learning how to live. It's a long slow process. Sometimes I think I'm going crazy. Sometimes I think, what's the use? Sometimes I back myself into that corner of self-obsession and think there's no way out. Sometimes I think I can't stand life's problems anymore, but then this program provides an answer and the bad times pass. Most of the time life's pretty good. And sometimes life is great, greater than I can ever remember. I learned to like myself and found friendship. I came to know myself a little bit and found understanding. I found a little faith, and from it, freedom. And I found service and learned that this provides the fulfillment I need for happiness. 182 Narcotics Anonymous Pothead my mother started calling me a pothead when I was 15. Today when I go to a Narcotics Anonymous meeting I call myself an addict. My first addiction was to food. I remember my mom putting me on a diet when I was 5 years old and I've been on one ever since. I've always had problems dealing with my feelings and socializing with people. I was born into an alcoholic family and we were not encouraged to express our feelings. I didn't know it was okay to be angry, sad, and depressed. As a child I isolated myself in my room and read. I don't remember going outside to play with my friends. I do remember hurting inside and feeling sorry for myself. I continued to get sicker inside and when my older sister offered to turn me on to a joint in the 7th grade, I accepted. I had told myself I would never smoke marijuana, but I thought I was smart enough to handle it. Problems associated with using began happening immediately. I started skipping school, I lost interest in my pastimes and I was getting in trouble at home. My attitude was rotten, I was belligerent and indifferent. I thought I was cool and getting high with the in thing. I began to realize that I was having a problem with pot when I bought a bag for my 13th birthday and it was all gone before the big day even arrived. My friends told me that was not normal. I tried to quit that summer, and I did, for three months. When I started getting high again it was worse. I was smoking more pot and started taking a few chemicals. I started school again, and it was obvious I had a problem. I would go to school high and then skip school to get high again. My grades dropped from A's to C's and D's. 
Luckily we moved and my parents never saw my grades. I met a girl who was also in junior high and who liked to party, so we started moving together. I managed to maintain through junior high. In high school my addiction started progressing more rapidly. I drank occasionally. I didn't like to drink because I always got sick. I took acid and speed occasionally, but I dropped out of high school my first year. I went back the second year and I dropped out again. 182. Hothead. 183. I got a GED the spring of my junior year and was sent to the state hospital this summer. I was suicidal. I thought I should kill myself because of all the things that I had done and since I didn't, the world was going to end. I lost it and I didn't think that would ever happen to me, I was too smart. My friends, parents, and doctors told me it was the drug. I could still handle it and started smoking pot again. In 8 months I was worse. I was smoking pot every day and selling it to support my habit. I had tripped a few more times and was taking speed to lose weight. I ended up in the hospital again, except this time it was a treatment center. The first few weeks were a struggle. I still wasn't sure what was real and what wasn't. I was afraid. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. I was too scared to go to meetings. I thought everybody belonged to some weird cult. The people gave me phone numbers and told me to call. I didn't go to meetings, and I relapsed. I remember feeling like I didn't belong in NA because pot was really my problem although I had used other drugs. I read the little white pamphlet Narcotics Anonymous. It said an addict was someone who, lived to use and used to live, and that our lives and thinking were centered on getting and using drugs. That sounded like me. Then it said they didn't care what drug I used and the only requirement for membership was the honest desire to stop using. I thought, well, maybe, just maybe they would let me stay. I started going to a meeting every day or I talked with another addict. The members told me they needed me and I began to feel a part of. I attended regularly and tried to support new meetings. I learned about the steps and I tried to work them. I didn't use, I took inventory, I made amends, and I prayed. That's one of the things I'm grateful for is having the freedom to have a God as I understood Him. One day I realized I was being free from my addiction. The obsession and the compulsion were no longer the dominating force in my life, growing spiritually was. I got a sponsor and I talked to her. I listened to others who had clean time. I watched others hoping I could learn from their mistakes, like what happens to people who don't go to meetings. I learned about spiritual principles, honesty, open-mindedness, willingness, humility, gratitude, forgiveness, and love. I slowly grew to accept myself, to love myself, and to love others. I'm still growing in these areas. I've heard it shared, I am able to love others, for I know I am loved. NA has given me the love I needed to grow. I worked on being willing and on helping others. I learned about service work. It started with picking up ashtrays, giving members rides to 184 Narcotics Anonymous. Meetings, cleaning up after meetings to being secretary of a group and taking meetings to institutions. I've learned that being of service is a way to show my gratitude to NA for saving my life. I feel real privileged to be clean today.
I'm 20 years old now and I've been around the program for over 2 minus half a year. Some days are better than others and other days, all I can do is hang on with both hands. I've learned that it's on my bad days that I can grow the most. I just keep on believing that it'll all be right as long as I don't use. I still do the same things I did in the first year of my recovery. I say, please, in the morning, thank you, at night, go to meetings, read the literature, live the steps, and talk to other addicts. Thanks to NA one of my greatest joys was the day I realized that just for today, I never have to use again. Written in 1980. I can't do any more time 185. I can't do any more time. I came to the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous as an addict, out of an institution for women. I came the first night I got out and it's been here that I've learned how to live, so that it hasn't been necessary for me to use any kind of drugs in my daily life. It has been here that I've learned a lot about myself, because we addicts are so very much alike. I've always seen another side of myself whenever problems and suggested solutions have been discussed at our meetings. I have learned, from those who are following the program of recovery to the best of their ability, how I can do the same if I am willing to make the effort. I have also learned from those who have made mistakes. I feel bad when I see that some leave this fellowship to try the old way again, but I know that I don't have to do that if I don't want to. Also it has not been necessary for me to steal or to write any bad checks. My addiction goes way back. I was drinking abusively, when I first started at 16, and I realized today that the reason for that was I was sick to begin with. I had this emotional illness and it was very deep. I don't think that if I hadn't been emotionally ill to begin with, that I would have gotten carried away with using. When it became noticeable that I was using alcohol more and more, being in the nursing profession, I tried experimenting with other drugs. It grew and grew and became a horrible problem. Although this is certainly a suicidal path in itself, when I was aware and in a lucid moment, I did realize I was hopelessly addicted. I did not know that there was any answer. There really wasn't at that time. I was in San Francisco, not knowing which way to turn, when I tried suicide and was unsuccessful. I was 26 years old at that time. I now think that if it had been possible for me, I would have come to this program at that same age as a lot who are here today. My pattern, however, continued. I have lost not only my self-respect but the respect and love of my family, my children, and my husband. I have lost my home and my profession. Somehow or other, I hadn't reached the point where I wanted to try this way of life or to try it all the way. I just had to. 185. 186 Narcotics Anonymous. Go on and try in my own way. I tried drugs again and was finally committed to another institution three times. The last time I went there I just felt that I couldn't do any more time. I didn't immediately connect it with my addiction. I just couldn't do any more time. It wasn't the thought, I can't use drugs, just, I can't do any more time. I just felt completely hopeless and helpless and I didn't have any answers. All of my emotional and spiritual pride had gone. 
I'm sure that when I was in the institution they doubted my sincerity in ever wanting to do anything about my problem. However, I did want to do something about it, and I know that this program doesn't work until we really do want it for ourselves. It's not for people who need it but for people who want it. I finally wanted it so bad I knocked on doors of psychiatrists, psychologists, chaplains and anywhere I could. I think one of my counselors, who just naturally loves all people, gave me a lot of encouragement, for I thoroughly took my first three steps. I admitted I was powerless over my addiction, that my life was unmanageable. I had tried so many other things, so I decided a power greater than myself could restore my sanity. To the best of my ability I turned my life and my will over to the care of God as I understood Him, and I tried in my daily life to understand God. I had read all kinds of metaphysical books. I agreed with them and thought they were great but I never took any action on them. I never tried any faith in my daily living. It's amazing how after I had gotten just this far, I began to get a little honesty and to see myself as I was. I doubted that I could get honest, but I became aware of myself by looking outside myself at the addicts around me, by getting to know them and understand them, by being friendly with them. I would like to give credit where credit is due, and I do believe that my daily attendance at psychotherapy groups with very understanding psychologists helped me become aware of myself so that I might do something about my problem, but when I came out, I thought, oh, can I make it outside? So many times institutions took so many years out of my life that I wondered if I could stay clean and do ordinary things. I doubted whether I could go ahead with just normal living, but God has seen fit to see that I have been provided for in this last year and a half. I've been able to work regularly, I didn't have steady jobs at first, but there was never any long period in between them. I can't do any more time 187. Although for a time I threw out the idea of going back to my profession, which is nursing, I have since reconsidered this and am now in the process of perhaps returning to full-time nursing. With the help of some very understanding people I have met, the future here looks very bright. In the meantime, I give myself to my job every day, as best I can, and have been doing it successfully, despite the fact that when I left the institution for the last time everyone thought I was unemployable. To me this is a spiritual program and the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience. Without the kind of help and the therapy of one addict talking to and helping another, I know that it wouldn't have been possible for me. The obsession to use drugs has been completely removed from me during this period, and I know that it's only by the grace of God, I now give my attention to my daily problems. It's amazing, having had a pattern of fear, anxiety, resentment and self-pity, how much of this too has been removed. No longer do these sway my life. I ask for help every morning and I count my blessings every night, and I'm real grateful that I don't have to go through the sickness that accompanies the taking of drugs of any kind. I think one of the biggest things that helped me here was that this is a program of complete abstinence. I got over the idea that I had a dual problem. I don't have a problem with this drug or that drug. I have a living problem, and this is all I need to think about today. 
I got a lot of help from my sponsor when it seemed that everyone had let me down, both family and friends. I don't know what I would have done had it not been for the doors that she opened in her letters. She shared her experience, her strength and her hope with me, and it was very beneficial. She continues to be my very good friend. Here in NA, I have found a family, friends, and a way of life. My own family has also been restored to me through working these steps, and not through directly working on the problem. A lot of wonderful things have happened to me. I can't conceive of anything ever happening that would make me want to forget this way of life. 188 Narcotics Anonymous Fat Addict I am an addict. I used at least 50 different types of drugs on an ongoing basis for a period of 18 years. I didn't know it when I started using. But I used drugs only for one reason, because I didn't like the way I felt. I wanted to feel better. I spent 18 years trying to feel different. I couldn't face the everyday realities of life. Being a fat kid, fat all my life, I felt rejected. I was born in Arizona in 1935 and I moved to California in the early 1940s. My family moved around from state to state and my father was married several times. He was a binge drinker. Either he was in a state of self-righteousness or a state of complete degradation. This is one of the many reasons we moved so often. As I moved from school to school, I would relate various experiences that I had and I would talk about my various stepmothers. For some reason, I was thought to be a liar. It seemed the only company that accepted me, no matter where I went, was the so-called lower-level people, and I never felt I was a lower-level person. It made me feel like I had some self-worth by being able to look down on them. My family life was confused and painful, but a lot of sound moral values were passed on to me in my upbringing. I always made the attempt to stay employed. As a matter of fact, on most occasions I managed to be self-employed in some type of business. I was even able to maintain some civic status by belonging to fraternal organizations. I was 5 feet 5 inches tall, and weighed 282 pounds. I ate compulsively to try and handle my feelings and emotions and to make me feel better. As a matter of fact, this is how I originally got into using heavy drugs. I wanted to lose weight so desperately that I became willing to use heroin. I thought I would be smart enough not to get hooked, that I could use and lose my appetite, feel good and outsmart the game. I bounced around the country and ended up in penitentiaries and jails. This was the beginning of the end. Not only was I a compulsive overeater and remained fat, but I was also addicted to the drugs I was using. 188. Fat Addict 189. Somebody told me about the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous when I was in the complete stage of degradation and desperation. Having no place to go, I walked into this fellowship feeling as low as a person can feel, like there was no way out. I was completely and totally morally bankrupt. I knew nothing about spiritual values. I knew nothing about living. Life ultimately was nothing but pain on a daily basis. All I knew was to put something in me, food or drugs, or to use sex to feel good, which just didn't do it for me anymore. I just couldn't get enough of anything. 
When I came to this program, I found something that I had never experienced before, total acceptance for who and what I was. I was invited to keep coming back to a fellowship that told me there were no fees or dues, that I had already paid my dues via my past life, and that if I kept coming back, I would find total freedom and a new way of life. Today, many years later, I find that I am free from addiction and compulsive overeating, and I have status in the community. I have a nice home and family, an executive position, and most of all I have a personal relationship with my God, which has made all these things possible. I am able to feel good, to feel joyful and blissful, to feel serenity, even when things are not as good as they might be. There is no question about it. I owe my life to the Narcotics Anonymous Fellowship in God. I can only extend my hope that if you too are suffering as I once was, you will practice the principles of Narcotics Anonymous, and find freedom from pain and a meaningful, prosperous life. 190 Narcotics Anonymous Early Services I started using and drinking when I was about 10 years old. My stepfa. There and I would go down to his boat and drink beer and smoke pot. Then he would force me to engage in homosexual acts with him. I was always very scared that he would beat me up. By age 11, my drinking had gotten worse, and he did start beating me. I finally went to my mother. She told me that we needed him to support us, for me to just do whatever he said, and don't make waves. By age 12, I couldn't take it at home anymore. I stole a hundred dollars from my mom and left home. After being gone for three nights, a man came up to me and asked if I wanted to earn some money. I agreed because I was almost broke by this time. I went to his house to take a shower. After I got dressed and came out, he asked if I took drugs. I said, I like everything. We snorted some cocaine and he started taking off my pants. The next day, he took me to his friend's house. On the way there he said, you are going to get good money and all the drugs you want. When we arrived, movie cameras were set up and I began my career in porno films. There were also two men in the bathroom fixing heroin and this was my first experience with heroin. By this time I had no feelings of self-worth and I did not care whom I hurt or what I did to hurt anyone else. By the time I was 14 and a half, I had my first overdose of heroin. When I got out of intensive care, it was hard for my sugar daddy to find me a recovery house. He finally got me into an adult program because he knew some people. At this program, I went to my first NA meeting. I was scared lonely and didn't want anything to do with anyone. At my second meeting, I threw a chair at the leader. I kept coming back for 90 days and I had to celebrate. I went out and got a fix. I thought it would be easy to get 90 days again. But after I went back out, I couldn't even get one day. I decided that I couldn't clean up where I was. So I relocated 3,000 miles away. Things got worse. I had to turn tricks to support my habit. One night, I blacked out in a club, got violent and was taken to a... 190. Early services 191. Mental hospital. The doctors kept me so severely sedated that I wandered around in a shuffle. Because I was only 15, 
The doctors called my father who I hadn't seen for two years. He came and got me. When we got into town, he dropped me off and said, call me sometime. At that point, I thought I might want to stop using. For the first time I can remember, I cried. I just sat at the airport and cried. I got right back into tricking and using, but I was so tired of lying, hustling, stealing, and using that I went to a meeting. I had just fixed before the meeting, but because I wanted to be accepted, I got up and said that I had six months clean. Then I went outside because I knew I was dying and I didn't know how to scream for help. My stepfather was at the meeting and I didn't even remember what he looked like. He followed me outside and said, we have to get you in a recovery house. Then he looked me straight in the eye and said, I love you. For the first time in my life I knew he cared. He then found a recovery house that would accept me. Before I got to the recovery house, however, I overdosed on barbiturates in a telephone booth while telling someone how to get to where I was so they could take me to the house. I stayed in the recovery house for 30 days. I go to a meeting every day now, and usually make 8 or 10 a week. Every morning when I get up I look at myself in the mirror and say, I'm okay for today. God, just for today, keep me clean. I'm almost 4 months clean, and I hurt most of the time. But today, I know that without this program, I will die. At this point in my recovery, I am actively involved in NA service. It keeps me busy and shows me a spiritual part of the program I never knew was there. I am slowly learning to trust my fellow members and know that I never have to be alone again. Today, I know there is hope. 192 Narcotics Anonymous I felt hopeless. No one in my family ever used drugs except as prescribed by a doctor. In fact, no one in my family even drank and I was taught that drunks and addicts did not solve their own personal and emotional problems and were moral degenerates. That's what I thought. In high school I started to use drugs because they helped me feel good about myself. I was so self-conscious and embarrassed about my looks that sometimes I just felt subhuman. I started to get high and became an overachiever to compensate for these feelings. College was a war until I discovered pot. I became a hippie, met a girl who liked to party and we were married. After school, I started using speed while traveling in my work. Soon the constant traveling and using caused my first wife to divorce me. This gave me a good excuse to go wild. I wanted to try every drug I could. A combination of narcotics, stimulants, and hallucinogens became my favorite. I started to lose the small business I had built up and felt guilty about what I had become, a business and social failure. I had to use something every day to obliterate my feelings of self-hatred, shame and guilt. I decided to get rich and go big time, kneeling between Chicago and New York. In order to finance the trick east, I set up my 15-year-old lover selling acid to her schoolmates. I began buying wholesale in the Midwest and reselling to students at a major Eastern University. Dealing drugs while traveling for business gave meaning to the words fear and paranoia. I fell in love with a woman and thought I could change for her. I thought everything would be okay. 
She helped me control my musing and I set out to impress her. My business revived for a while, but then I began to use heavily again and things got worse. My second wife left me. My business failed. I felt hopeless. I needed to use to feel okay. I tried to stay high and began drinking heavily and daily again. I just did not want to feel anything. I didn't like me. I just wanted to escape from myself. I overdosed on synthetic narcotics and woke up in the hospital. While still in the hospital. 192. I felt hopeless 193. I began to feel better and publicly declared my intention to stop using. I was going to enter the mental outpatient clinic, solve all the problems that I thought caused me to use hard drugs and never have to use again. Of course I continued to smoke pot and drink beer. After all, everyone I knew did. My business gradually fell back together and I had money in my pocket again. That was my downfall. I could now afford that most glamorous, non-addictive substance, cocaine. How wonderful was my new chemical lover. She made me feel so, so good, again and again. I began to lie, steal and overcharge my clients to get the money for my new habit. I went to several doctors, feigning symptoms appropriate to get prescriptions for large quantities of sleeping pills and sedative hypnotics. I used some of the prescribed drugs, but mostly sold them to get coke. Often, I used too much coke and was always in fear of a heart attack, but I could shoot some downs to knock me out. Eventually, I overdosed this way. Again, I wound up in the hospital. Once again I started to feel better after a few days clean in the hospital. I resolved to stop using again and agreed to get help from a psychiatrist. I tried. I told him how bad I was, how I felt about myself, and sometimes how good I felt when clean. I stayed away from my old friends for a while. The psychiatrist seemed to want to help me. He suggested I take some mood balancing pills, so I bought some and tried them. The mood levelers didn't make me feel any better, so I traded them in for some cocaine. I felt better for a little while, but it soon got worse. I began to fantasize a lot about my suicide. Something inside wanted me to live, so I talked to my doctor and he put me in a mental hospital for evaluation. I was detoxed, sent to a rehab center and attended my first NA meeting. Now I knew there was a way to stop. Recovery became a real possibility. It took nine months of regular attendance at meetings before I surrendered and came to believe that I, too, could recover. The problems that I felt had caused me to use began to melt away. The fellowship and a newly discovered higher power have helped me stay clean. My attitudes toward other people and my feelings about myself have begun to change. I understand today 